kind of puts it in perspective, doesn't it? I was going to show that on Mother's Day, but I thought I would spread that out a little bit longer because the mothers will do anything for the kiddos, won't they? We thank you, moms. But beyond that, there's a message here too, and it's about perspective. That boy only saw life through his own perspective, didn't he? He only saw it his way and his problems and all of those things. He only saw in the world. How many of us are guilty of that, of not saying, what's, what's my friend been through? What's my wife or my mom been through that would put her in that kind of a place? Oh, can we bear with her? Can we love her? Can we stand with her in Jesus' name? The first thing is just what we sing when we sing that song. I crucify me. I crucify me. I crucify me. Oh, Lord. Jesus said to his disciples, you are no longer your own. You belong to me. How many of you are living that way? I just want mine. I'm a Christian. I know the Bible. I get mine. It's what it says. That's not what Jesus did, was he? He said, just join me. I've overcome the world. And in God's time, in God's time, he's making all things new. Now, we've been talking about the circumcised heart. So everybody put your hand on your heart. It's a good thing. It's, it's, it's beating, especially yours, Logan. I see that dude. Big old heart. Boy, old, old Logan's heart's going like this. Boom, 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 boom. If we say, I'm no longer my own, guess what? That means our passion center is no longer our own that we surrender our passion center. We've, we've all sought our own ways, turned everyone to his own way, right? But as we say, God circumcised my heart this morning, we talked about the journey that we're on together. We talked about the journey, how the, the children of Israel were in the wilderness for so long, but now they got to this place that they could go across. They could go across the river. And they needed the presence of the Lord God. And there was the Ark of the Covenant. And the presence of the Lord God stopped the water. The presence of the Lord God will make a way for you in your life, period. It will stop the rushing water and let you pass in Jesus' name. When they got to the other side, there would be a war coming on. They would have to conquer many enemies on that side. Jericho would be the first place. And so he said, I can't have you think like a slave anymore. I can't think, let you think like a wanderer. I can't just provide all the manna for you anymore either because you're fixing to have to fight. Right there, he said, okay, I want you to circumcise all the men because the slave mentality was getting circumcised off of the people right there. Your identity is changing too. Is your heart changing? Last week, we talked about the circumcised heart. Are we allowing God to scrape off the selfishness in our heart and circumcise our heart? Because at the end of that circumcision, there was a waiting period, Ricky Wallace, there was a waiting period there at Gilgal, which means rolling. And while they were waiting there at Gilgal, what was happening in them, there, there was healing happening. Not just in their physical body, but a healing happening with our identity. You see, when God shows us who we really are in Christ, we get healed. Because when we're just in our flesh trying to make ourselves happy, we'll never be healed. We'll be wondering and restless. But when he shows you, you're my treasure you're my son, you're my daughter, you're my precious daughter. Oh, you're my precious daughter. I love you. I've got a place for you, and I've got rest for you today. You don't have to get it done. God's already done it through his son, Jesus. And there's healing taking place this morning at Treasure because you're brave enough to let it happen in Jesus' name. You're brave enough to let the things that have had power over you in your life fall off in Jesus' name. Let them fall off today. Let them come off of you today in Jesus' name. And as we receive our healing, I'm the treasure of the Lord Jesus. I'm his precious son. The work's been done on the cross, and now I can rest. And in this place, we start to move forward to another place. I'm going to read these scriptures, and I'm going to ask Ricky Wallace to come. Because as we talk about the healing family, one reason, one great reason we come and gather together is because we need each other, don't we? 
We need to see that we are all uh, walking through this faith journey together and winning the victory together in Jesus' name. We need to see it more than just on Sunday morning. We need to do life together. We need to be gathering up in groups. We need to be praying together. We don't need to be gossiping together, by the way, in Jesus' name. Joshua chapter 5, verse 8 and 9. Then, when they'd finished the circumcision, all the males of the nation, they stayed in their place in the camp until they were healed. Then the Lord said to Joshua, This day I have rolled away the reproach, rolled away the derision and ridicule of Egypt from you, the slave mentality, understand? So that the name of this place will be called Gilgal, which means rolling to this day. Now, when I read this for the first time, or when I was studying and I read it, God said, Hey, Brother Stan must have had a reason for calling Rolling Hills, Rolling Hills. Rolling Hills is our daddy. They're our granddaddy, okay? 40, 50 years ago, Ricky Wallace is going to tell us a story. And I said, Brother Stan probably knew somewhere in him that there was going to be some rolling. It wasn't just because the physical reels, hills were rolling. And so Ricky's going to come here in a second, and he's going to tell us what that rolling means. Because, see, that's the origin of our family of God. In Jesus' name. Also, I want to tell you this. There were some challenges at Rolling Hills. The Holy Spirit was moving in such a powerful way, but there got to be some challenges there because man started to get in the way. Instead of letting the Spirit do his thing, which he'll always do, man started to get in the way. So guess what the Spirit did? Okay, y'all got it. Do y'all want to have that happen here at Treasure? You see... We are not going to repeat that part of the past. We're going to pe repeat the beautiful part of the past in Jesus' name. Read this last scripture, and then Ricky's going to come. Then the Lord said to Joshua, This day I've rolled away the reproach and derision and ridicule of Egypt from you, so the name will be called Gilgal. Ricky, why don't you come, brother? Ricky was with Brother Stan for 50 years. I think Brother Stan baptized him when he was nine years old or something. Five. Put your hands together, Ricky. I want you to see this legacy, okay? I want you to know that your roots are deep in Jesus' name, okay? Go ahead, Brother. First, let me say thank you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your commitment. Thank you for your obedience to Christ. Thank you for your obedience one to another. I started out with Brother Stan as a Baptist individual, and please don't think for a moment I'm saying anything against Baptists cause, or Presbyterians or Church of Christ or anyone, for they're all flowers in God's garden, and they all have a purpose in this world. But all of a sudden, a wonderful thing happened. The Holy Ghost got a hold of Brother Stanfield, and the Spirit came upon him. And when it came upon him, it came upon him in such a powerful way, he didn't care anymore what the people actually thought of him. He didn't care anymore whether you thought he was crazy or not. And believe me, most of the spiritual leaders in the community around kind of looked at him like perhaps maybe the butter done slid off his corn on the cob. And he didn't care a bit. He was excited about Jesus Christ. He was excited that all of a sudden he had a purpose in life. And as I stand up here this morning, i got a very special word for you from the Lord this morning. As Brother Allen asked me to share a few things, I stayed up most of the night asking God, just exactly, what would you like for me to say, Lord? And he wanted me to tell you that he knew you before you ever got here. That he's been working over 40 years for this house right here. And I was there 40 years ago when he started with Brother Stanfield. And I see some faces here that was there too. My sister Brown right here. I had the opportunity in the house of Rolling Hills to get to minister and get to speak and get to baptize in water and get to baptize in the Holy Spirit. And I got to talk to youth for over 13 years. And it was a wonderful thing. It was such a wonderful thing. We've seen an outpouring of the Spirit like we never seen before. And if you want to know why the purpose, the ro word rolling hills can't die, it's because some of us seen something there we've never seen again. We've never seen before. We've never experienced a love like we experienced the love at rolling hills. 
And it was because of one man, a man that was committed to God, a man that poured his life and soul out, a man that fell on his altar and cried to God. He cried out the same thing that King Solomon cried out. He didn't ask for things about himself. He didn't ask for his own. He asked for wisdom to be able to lead his people, for wisdom to be able to show these people how to get God in their heart, how to receive Jesus in their life, how to be made whole again, how to get the pain out of their lives. And in asking for such a thing, I feel like he shared with us that he felt like King Solomon was granted a sneak peek into heaven as to what the allotment of time given to a man should be used like. And he tried his best in every way to do the same thing. We saw miracles there. We've seen healings there. We've seen people get out of wheelchairs. We've seen miraculous things there. And I can recall one time when I was sitting there on a bench and he had a man come to our church, Roger Till. I'm sure you remember Roger Till. He had a finger about that long. And when he pointed it at you, it scared you to death. And he got up and he began to speak and he spoke about two minutes and he stopped and he got up and he walked down the aisle and he walked down and he looked at my wife and he said, you're going to have a baby. He's supposed to be a prophet, you see. And I thought, well, that's pretty, pretty easy to recognize seeing she's eight months pregnant. <laughs> but then he told her that even though she had lost two children, this one was going to make it. And even though I'd spent multitudes of dollars, several thousand dollars, getting the reports that it was going to be a little boy, he looked in her heart and said, in your heart I see a little girl. We're changing it right now. In Jesus' name, it'll be a little girl. I said, what kind of man can do that? Who can do that? <laughs> this man, he, he's a joke. He can't do that. But I was there in the hospital kneeling beside the bed when my daughter right back yonder came. And I want you to know... She was loved before she ever got here. She was appreciated before she ever entered into this world. And Jesus is telling you this morning, you was loved before you ever got here. There was a way made for you before you, before you ever even knew it. This church was built for a purpose. And that purpose is for you. It's for you who are sitting here today. All the way around that mountain that Cindy Brown and I went, that several of you went, I walked with mighty good men. I mean mighty good men. Rod Brown was one of them, Cindy's husband, a very anointed man. I loved that man. He was a good teacher. He was a good instructor. He was a prime example of Jesus Christ. And we saw these men bind together, just like I'm seeing men bind together here today. And it's like when you go on a journey somewhere on a vacation and you see a lot of wonderful things and you go back home and you come back around. When you get to going on that again and you see it coming, you know you're almost there. I see it coming. I see God's spirit here. I see miraculous things going to happen here. I see people getting up out of wheelchairs here. I see cancer being put up under the feet of Jesus. I see wonderful things happening in this house. And let me say something to you. Before it all happens in full, we don't want to lose it. We don't want to give it up. We don't want to let greed come in. We don't want to let flesh get in the way. We don't want to rise against one another. The de devastator, he loves division. He likes to get in here and whisper in your ear, whisper behind his hand, what's wrong with this one and what's wrong with that one and what this one thought about. But I want to tell you something. There's not anything wrong with any of you that Jesus Christ can't fix this morning. I want to read a brief passage of Scripture right here right quick that Brother Stanfield believed in as he started the house of Rolling Hills. i got to put my better glasses on here. <laughs> King Solomon wrote, There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the sun. There's a time to be born and there's a time to die. God's saying this morning to you, it's a time to be born, born again, born in his name. And it's a time for the things in you, the impurities to die. It's a time for the flesh to die this morning. There's a time to kill and there's a time to heal. Today is the time to kill that pain inside of you. We look at the past and we hurt. But I'm going to tell you something. 
God's not worried about where you've been. He's worried about where you're going. He's not worried about who hurt you yesterday. He's worried about the victory that you'll have tomorrow. There's a time to weep and there's a time to laugh. When sadness is in the hearts of our brothers and sisters, we should have the strength and the ability to weep with them. But when victory comes upon their lives and when they've taken the impurities out of their hearts and they've made room for Jesus Christ, it's time to laugh and shout joy, hallelujah. There's a time to scatter stones and there's a time to gather them back. There's a time to embrace and there's a time to refrain. There's a time to search and there's a time to give up. I saw in the house of Rolling Hills all the miracles. And as I seen the faithfulness of the people, I want you to know something. Where the presence of God is, there also is his blessings. When God comes on the scene, ten mean madmen can't keep you from getting your blessing. When God comes on the scene, things change. When God came upon Stanfield at Rolling Hills, things began to happen. I was one of the ushers with Rod Brown that got to count the money. And all of a sudden, 15, 20, 25, 30 thousand dollars a week started coming in. Where'd all that come from? It's like the windows of heaven was open and God poured his blessings out upon that house. And over 200 churches did Stanley go and build all around the country, all in Africa, all around the world. Under his ministry, it was a great thing. But then all of a sudden, people got to seeing all that money. They got to seeing all that wealth. They got to be being jealous of one another. They got to looking at each other's wives. And all of a sudden, immorality came into that church. All of a sudden, the devastator allowed unfit things to be there. And I want to tell you something. When the presence of God comes down and it gets real close to us, the impurities are coming out of you. They won't, li- they won't exist. And when they come out of you, we need to be smart enough and intelligent enough to throw them away, to not let them destroy us. Do not let us exalt them and hold them up. I know after 15 years of rolling hills, the people began getting vicious. And I'm talking about six, seven, eight hundred, nine hundred people. It was a huge, huge crowd, and it was doing wonderful, wonderful works. But all of a sudden, they got more caught up in their self than they did Jesus. And all of a sudden, they raised against Stanfield and began to complain. And you know what? Stanfield looked at him and he said, the same God that sent me here is sending me home. And y'all have a better plan. I want you to go ahead and carry out your plan. Stanfield went home. And he stayed home for a couple of years. And I want you to know, the church went to hell in a handbag. It just went down just like nobody's business. When God lifts his presence, when he lifts his spirit, you're nothing. You're nobody. You can do nothing. I want you to know today that whatever one of us need is the spirit of God in us. Whatever one of us need is the presence of God in our lives. When Rolling Hills began, I was a very poor guy. I wasn't just dirt poor, but I did have to rob Peter every month to pay Paul. I mean, I did have to try to get by the best I could. I don't know if any of y'all have ever had to do that or not. Just try to get by the best you could. But because of the faithfulness that Stanfield taught each of us, all of a sudden, my life began to change. All of a sudden, when I realized that everything about this world ain't about me, when God gives me something, guess what? All he gives it to me for is to see whether I'm a faithful servant or not. And when I become faithful... When I become faithful in my giving, when I begin to say, God, here's what I owe you, and I'm giving it to you happily, all of a sudden my life began to change. All of a sudden I could afford my life. All of a sudden I could pay my bills. All of a sudden I could help other people. And I say to you this morning, I don't need your money. God don't need your money. But you are the one who needs to be faithful to God. You the one that needs the presence of God in your life. You the one that can't afford not to give. I want you to know this morning that when you give, that money's used in a good way. When you give, Brother Allen, I've seen him give away uh, food at the Shade Tree and all the other places. I've seen him bless the homeless. I've seen him bless the weary. I've seen him use what God has given him in an intelligent manner. You're not being scammed and you're not being taken advantage of. What you're being 
is in a foolish manner if you don't give. Because if you don't give, I've learned it. All of a sudden, if what God gives me I think is mine and I don't give him back his portion, he don't have to give me nothing next month. My life will dry up. I begin to wilt on the vine. He said, I am the vine and you are the branches. And you have to be connected to that vine in order to get nourished, in order to be fulfilled, in order for your life to blossom, in order for it to grow. You have to be connected to that vine. In order to be connected to that vine, you have to be faithful. You have to be faithful. When Stanley left Rolling Hills, he gave me two little bottles of oil and told me to hold on to them till the Lord tells you to use them. I held on to that oil. Two years later, the Lord told me to go to Stanfield's house and pour one of them bottles of oil on his head and anoint him and tell him it was time for him to go back and start another ministry. And it wasn't at Rolling Hills. I said, you pray about it, and if God tells you to do that, you do it. He prayed about it, and he decided it was time for him to do it. And he came right here. First, he went back to the community center where we met for a while until we found a piece of land and all. And I came here, and I built the first building over yonder and uh, started out in it. And then he came and built this building. I built it, too, and then he moved over here. But what you don't realize is God was building that building for you. He was building it for Brother Allen. He was building it for Brother Gilbert. He was building it for Brother Preston. He was ahead of you before you ever got here. He already knew you would be here. He already knew you would need this house. Don't think that God can't meet your needs. And all of a sudden, I feel the same spirit. In this house right here that we felt at the beginning of Rolling Hills. I see the same people. I see people jumping up and down and praising the Lord. I see you worshiping God. I see you crying out to the Spirit. And believe me when I tell you, the Spirit of the Lord is going to fa fall out on this place. And the rest of the community around here is going to look around. And they're going to say, what's the matter with them people over yonder? But I'm going to tell you something. When you stand in the presence of God, it's not going to matter what they think. It's not going to matter when your life is healed, when all the impurities are taken out of your heart, when you're made whole again, when you stand in the sight of God, all your needs are met. First, seek ye the same kingdom of God, and everything else is added to you. I believe it's going to come to pass right here. I want you to know that each one of you here today, you're so very special to God. You're a family. God didn't call any of us to sit home and try to live this life by ourselves. You're called to be a part of the bride of Christ. You're called to unify yourself one to another. You're called to be a family. And I see it happening in this church. All of a sudden, I see that color don't my matter, that rich or poor don't matter, that the brokenhearted are being lifted up by the others. I see that people are standing up for one another. And I thank God I, I get to be here and be a part of it. I thank God that I had to go all the way around a mountain 40 years. But I'm back. I'm back right here with you. And the Spirit of God's back. And He's going to fall out upon this church right here today. I thank God for some of them who went around that mountain with me, like Sister Brown right here. And, and Brother Allen may not know that years ago, when he was in wrongdoing, that Brother Gary Don, that Brother Preston, God was working for y'all while you was in wrongdoing. God was preparing a place for you before you got here. God was building this house right here. Because he knew in, the, in, in time, there's a time for everything under the seasons. He knew in time he was going to clarify all this. And he was going to bring you and set you right here. And he was going to anoint you. And the anointing that he places upon you will be second to none. I got a bookmarker in my Bible that picture of Stanfield because his eyes is always right on me and I can't blow no smoke in the air because he's looking right straight at me. He's sitting up there beside the Lord making sure that I say what's right. I want to read you the passage of scripture in which the Lord gave me to give to him when I went and spoke to him and he was supposed to build this church because he's not here now and you're here and this passage of scripture is for you. You who gather here today. It comes from the book of Isaiah and it says I will have compassion on you says the Lord your Redeemer 
To me, this is like the days of Noah, when I swore that the waters of Noah would never again cover the earth. So now I have sworn not to be angry with you. The Lord don't look at your past, I'm telling you. He looks at the future. He looks at how precious you are today. Though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, my unfailing love for you will not be shaken. Nor shall my covenant of peace be removed from you, says the Lord, who has compassion upon you. Regardless of what you've done wrong in life, the Lord's compassion is sufficient. The Lord's love is sufficient. All your sons and daughters shall be taught by the Lord, and great will be all your children's peace. In righteousness you shall be established. Oppression will be far from you. You will have nothing to fear. Terror will be moved from your hearts. It will not come near you. If anyone attacks you, believe me, it is not from me. It is not my doings. Whoever attacks you shall fall at your feet. See, I am the creator, the blacksmith, who fans the coals of flames, who forges the weapons for its work. And it is I who have cr created the devastator to work havoc among the people. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. And not one tongue that accuses you shall have success. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And this is the vindication from me that I give to you. I want you to know this morning that you're so very special. I don't think perhaps just coming to church on Sunday, you realize just what God has done for you. I don't know if you realize how much love he has for you. I don't know if you realize that he has gone way out of his way for many years to make a way for you, to prepare a way for you, to set your feet on a path of righteousness. I told you a while ago I had two little bottles of oil given to me at the close of Rolling Hills. I still have one of them little bottles right here. And it's been in my desk for many years. And the Lord told me to bring it this morning and to anoint this man right over here, Brother Allen, and to place upon him a fleece of righteousness, a fleece of righteousness that he has sought. 